Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here, and welcome back to witnessing the best of human ingenuity. This week's space action covers not only all that sweet SpaceX Starbase goodness, but a bunch of great rocket launch excitement. Also, a gripping showcase of cosmic exploration from this brand new space telescope. Yes, Euclid is already delivering, so get ready to be inspired because there was no shortage of stuff to dive right into this week. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. So we left Starbase last week after that incredible full pressure water deluge system test and of course the next step we were hoping for was some static fire action. Just think about this, when water is converted to steam, its volume is increased by around 1600 times, so if only a small percentage of that water being ejected from the system is converted to steam, you can just imagine how this is going to look. I assume more like the tests that we see over at NASA Stennis, like with this RS-25 engine test. Hopefully we'll get a visual answer of just how much steam will be created soon with SpaceX preparing for action. The orbital launch mount has yet again been host to loads of activity this week. What we are looking at here are the cryogenic lines being purged from any debris and contaminants, a great sign that things were gearing back up. We also saw scaffolding being removed from the upper mount this week, indicating that the launch mount's repairs as well as Booster 9's internal work has been completed. You can especially see some taller scaffolding was removed here, which will allow the crew to reach the booster's access door. The painting crews have been smashing out the hours this week. It almost seems like everything that can be painted on the orbital launch mount has been. The booster quick disconnect hood has had a fresh coat of paint compared to last week. The gigantic legs, you bet. It's nice to see all of this being spruced up, yet more signs that we are not far away from exciting testing. If SpaceX is the engine, we, the audience, are the propellant. You can't help but get sucked right in, can you? I just love this video by everyday astronaut and cosmic perspective from the static fire at the start of the year. Hopefully we will again soon see that fiery action from Booster 9 along with the water deluge system. Are you excited? I know I am. Lab Padre's Rover 2 stream caught Booster 9 performing an igniter test, and this gave us a nice view of it wiggling its grid fins minutes later. Check out how clear the launch pad area is. The reason why soon became obvious. On Friday, right at the start of the closure at 6 in the morning, the road was closed, and it was time to test those engines. As is tradition with these tests now, up went the tower arms opening up into the launch position. The tank farm came to life, and propellant loading was on its way. With both liquid oxygen and methane now loaded into the vehicle, engine chill started up and it was time for Booster 9 to perform. Alive came the fire suppression system and listen carefully. That was almost a quiet, deep whisper from the engines, almost preempting the gigantic shout that will come with the static fire next. Elon posted this message saying that he thinks that they've got around a 50% chance of being able to reach orbital velocity. That will be an incredible milestone if it becomes reality. Right, so let's move over to the build site. As usual, we were treated again with some Mega Bay 2 stacking, with the second section of the fifth level being rolled out and stacked into place, and it's been sat down nicely on the back right corner. A sweet shot, by the way, of a moon set with both Mega Bays standing proud here by Starbase Surfer. The third section was moved into the ring yard later that very day, which has since been lifted into place, and the fourth final section also arrived ready to go. Hopefully by next week, we'll have a fully stacked fifth level with only cladding and a top roof section to go. It may perhaps end up being similar to Mega Bay 1 with rooms such as offices at the top just as an example. We also witnessed some disassembly too, with the northern tracking dish used for vehicle communications being taken apart. It'll be interesting to see where SpaceX goes from here with that. There was a license given to them in January for ground communications at Massey's, so maybe the dish will simply be reconstructed there. In fact, in this image from RGV, we can also see a new area being set up, which looks to have direct line of sight to both Massey's and the launch complex. On the vehicle side, we saw Ship 30's forward dome section being stacked with the nose cone and the payload bay assembly. Its common dome section moved into the high bay on Wednesday, and this section essentially stacks under the nose cone and forward section assembly to create a 12 ring and nose cone stack. The middle liquid oxygen section will be stacked next, and then finally the aft dome section. 
So earlier this week, Jack with NSF got this clear shot of the new test article that had been rolled out into the ring yard. It is made up of a booster forward section, and more importantly, the hot staging ring here on top. The booster forward section was actually originally dedicated to booster 11, now mutated into this test article with many, many more stringers being added. The hot staging ring clamped up on top looks to be a version of the ring that we saw in the production site last week. However, this one has had much more work done to it. The main thing to note is that it mostly lacks external stringers at all. These solid looking triangular units are being used instead. Chameleon Circuit shows it well in this render actually. In addition, there's a metal beam running around the middle of the vertical gaps which will help provide support, and a torus shaped metal sheet around the inside of the ring too. That includes diagonal supports to help resist collapse from twisting or torsion action. There are loads of new design elements to be verified here of course, so soon enough it was moved from the build site over to the Massey site along with a heavily reinforced ship aft section. Now that section was to help simulate a full ship being stacked on top. The day after the rollout, the test article was lifted onto the can crusher at Massey's. Interestingly, they had made that hot staging ring simply removable. It was taken off and placed on the ground for about an hour, and then lifted back on and clamped with the booster forward section once again. The day after, the skirt section was lifted onto the test article with the can crusher cap. Now, the idea here is that the pull down lines are attached to the base of this unit. This is then used to perform that ultimate crush test, an important evaluation for a very important test article. Just remember, a fully loaded Starship will be pushing down with all that mass multiplied by the g-forces in flight. If the ship weighs in at around 1400 metric tons as an example, at only 2g, the hot staging ring would need to support a good 3000 tons or so. The higher the thrust to weight ratio of the super heavy, the more weight will be pushing down on those rings. TDSN posted a few neat thoughts on the ring section recently. If you look closely, there is a pattern that repeats here in a set of three. The space engineer also rendered this for me to show as well. See this larger spacing between pairs of exhaust vents? That's interesting, isn't it? From a real photo, you can probably make this out from a more recent image by Starship Gazer. This, we think, means that in a future six ring vacuum engine layout, the engines should be paired up tightly so that they match up with the pairs of venting areas. With the six vacuum engines laid out in this way, it could allow the three central sea level engines to have a little more freedom of movement. In fact, the more we think about the hot staging, the more it could make sense for only the vacuum engines to fire up for separation. At that point, you don't really need gimbal control, and those three could fire up right after clearance anyway. Early in the week, we were also treated to a cryogenic proofing test from Ship 28. It took just under an hour for the ship to be fully filled, with it beginning to detank a few hours later. Everything looked normal for this test, and four days later, two self-propelled modular transporters were moved down to Massey's and were loaded with counterweights and ship transportation equipment. However, before it was moved back to the build site to receive its engines, it first snuck in another cryo test with liquid oxygen and nitrogen once again fully filling its tanks and holding there for quite some time before slowly detanking. We certainly can't wait to see what happens over the next few weeks, so make sure that you are following along. Thanks a bunch for all the comments last week supporting our efforts towards hitting the half million subscriber mark. That kind of blows my mind to be totally honest and it is all thanks to you of course. With all this action at Starbase over the past few weeks, it's really tricky to keep up with everything. So much so that it's hard to fit in all those essential family life requirements. Like cooking for example, just figuring out what you should cook, needing to go to the market and get the stuff that you need. Ugh, it's just exhausting thinking about it sometimes, isn't it? Well, introducing HelloFresh, the sponsor of today's video. They are the ultimate meal kit delivery partner crafted with your flexibility in mind. I can just hand pick some of the amazing mouthwatering meals and let them handle the rest. All of the fresh ingredients arrive in no time right to the doorstep, and my wife and I can just pretend to be the direct source of culinary magic in our own home. Just tactfully discard all that packaging so that the family thinks that you did it all yourself, and soak in all that sweet praise. The great thing is that I'm not overbuying big quantities and then needing to figure out what to do with the leftover ingredients. Instead, HelloFresh sends us these little pre-portioned bits and pieces perfectly sized, much 
less waste and certainly more sustainable. The recipe options make sense too because they work with suppliers to bring you the freshest seasonal ingredients possible. The meals are super quick to organise which is great for us when we are late home from the studio or the office. We've gone through a bunch of recipes but just love these three in particular. The Tex-Mex black bean burrito bowl that the kids love, this roast pork belly with rice and Asian greens is amazing and perhaps my personal favourite the beef rump with mash and salad. I've got another one of those on the way next week. The great thing is you can order meal plans designed for small or large families so the amounts are tailored just for your situation. Simply choose a plan from the website and away you go. Head to hellofresh.com and use code 50marcus at checkout for 50% off plus free shipping. The link is in the description. Thank you, HelloFresh. SpaceX's Galaxy 37 mission launched midweek with Falcon 9 taking off here. Give it up for Booster 1077 on its sixth flight here. This mission was all to place Intelsat's satellite into a geostationary transfer orbit. This one is a C-band only communication satellite, so a fairly standard kind of mission on yet another night flight. I do just want to point out that I quite enjoy Atticus Federa's hosting style. It was a good mix of technical but understandable information not dumbed down too much for the space fans, but also not so complicated that it would have been hard to understand. It was once again a nice clear night with the ground cameras following that beautiful exhaust plume right up to stage separation. A super quality feed again from the second stage, both from the rear facing cameras focused on the engine, but the fairing separation shot wonderful also. The booster itself was destined for that spicy re-entry before landing on the drone ship, just read the instructions. I will say we cover a lot of these and the fact that drone ship landings are essentially just standard parts of the coverage these days, it's almost weird isn't it? Do you even remember the last landing that wasn't successful? Most people wouldn't after all this time. Anyway, there we go, another success ticked off for SpaceX, but do yourself a favour and check out the quality of this deployment footage. These higher quality camera views might might be a little underrated. This is freaking breathtaking stuff. Speaking of the Falcon 9, news has just dropped informing us that we will soon see another Axiom space mission. We obviously knew that Axiom 3 is coming soon, hopefully towards the end of the year, but NASA and Axiom Space have now signed up for the fourth mission to the International Space Station. Axiom Mission 4 is expected to spend around 14 days at the ISS, and this is about four days longer than with Axiom 2. We are talking quite some time away in around 12 months or so. The crew are not yet yet selected, so Axiom will be proposing those in due course. A big milestone this week with the launch of the very last Antares 230 Plus rocket for the CRS-NG-19 mission. Hidden within the fairings was the Cygnus spacecraft, filled with over three tonnes of cargo for the International Space Station. Liftoff for this was of course from NASA's Wallops flight facility being streamed at glorious 720p, the Antares there lighting up the night sky. So why is this rocket being retired and is there a replacement for it? Well, it mostly comes down to the logistical issues with the current design. The Antares 230 Plus's first stage is manufactured by Ukrainian agencies and it's propelled using two Russian-made RD-181 engines. Those run from a similar kerosene and oxygen propellant mixture which isn't necessarily unusual, but obviously due to recent conflicts and sanction action, organising more engines from Russia is, well, Problematic, isn't it? Northrop Grumman had supply in stock, but after this latest launch, they have officially retired the vehicle. Three minutes into the launch, the first stage cut off, fairing separation, and the second stage solid rocket engine kicked into action. That is a little odd, really. You don't normally see a liquid first stage with a second solid propellant stage these days. That very stage took the Cygnus spacecraft to its drop-off orbit. And there it goes as it kicks off its mission to the ISS. About two and a half days later, there it was, Cygnus NG-19 successfully berthed. So what replaces this vehicle? Well, Northrop Grumman is working with Firefly Aerospace now to develop the updated version of the Antares. Instead of the 230 Plus, this will be known as the Antares 330. It will be bigger and better than the previous versions, and not only that, along with ISS resupply, they aim to expand into other avenues of the launch market, including commercial, defence and government missions. It is a lengthy work in progress though, and at best we won't see this flight 
until 2025 at the earliest. We had some great launch action from the ISRO once again this week. The last time that we covered one was with the ambitious Chandrayaan-3 mission taking off just a few weeks ago. Just 16 days later this week, ISRO was back to launch their PSLV rocket. Seven satellites on board for the Singapore government and private agencies now. This is the PSLV-CA, or the core alone configuration. And as you might have spotted, it doesn't have any strap-on boosters at all, like all other PSLV configurations. Therefore, the main solid stage booster here is launched all on its lonesome, just a few roll control thrusters needed. A fabulous liftoff with the big thrust to weight ratio just demonstrating how powerful that first stage is. It's one of the largest solid rocket boosters in the world actually, with just over 138 metric tons of propellant, about a minute and a half before stage separation, and that second stage now using liquid propellant thrusting onward with a single Vickers engine. The PSLV here is a four-stage rocket, and we were shown some great footage of this being assembled. This is the first stage being constructed in the VAB. Fast forwarding now through to fairing separation, the main payload for this mission, the DSSAR satellite, is for Earth observation and uses a synthetic aperture radar. Second engine cut off there, and off goes the third stage. This is also an unusual rocket in a way, because now we have moved back to a solid propellant similar to stage one. Along with the main satellite, also on board, six small sats belonging to various institutes and agencies from Singapore. We then have stage three burnout, and the fourth and the last stage ignited to fully reach that deployment orbit. As with most PSLV launched deployments, the main payload was separated first, followed by all six of these small sats. Now, while we are on the topic of the ISRO, a quick update on the exciting Chandrayaan-3 moon lander mission. The last time that we updated you on this, the spacecraft had successfully reached the intended Earth orbit, but had not yet performed the larger critical translunar injection burn. Good news since then, because as of this week, after orbiting the Earth for one last time, it fired up its engines destined now for the moon. In fact, the day this video is being released, we should be seeing confirmation that Chandrayaan-3 has placed itself into an orbit by performing its lunar orbit insertion maneuver. It's a really exciting mission, so do keep an eye on it to check out the latest updates as they arise. Now, arguably most exciting of all this week was the first images from the brand new Euclid Space Telescope released by ESA. This telescope, if you recall, was launched on a Falcon 9 just a month ago, and now it has finally reached its destination at Lagrange Point 2, joining the Gaia and the James Webb Space Telescopes already there. Just check out these test images taken by the instruments on board. One important note is that these images were produced with very minimal tuning done. We are just really seeing the early stages of configuration and testing, but they already look stunning, don't they? Imagine everything that we might get to see once they have it fully tuned up. This first image is a view captured by the VIS, Euclid's visible instrument. This one captures sharp and crisp images in visible light, and if you zoom in a little, you can see the stars and galaxies close up. Some of these bright lines that you can see here are actually from cosmic ray interference. Yes, the images here are largely unprocessed, so these generally unwanted artifacts still remain. Once Euclid officially begins its mission, it's going to give out loads more detailed razor-sharp images. Now just check out the second set of images here. These were taken by the Near Infrared Spectrometer and Photometer Instrument, or the NISP. As you might have guessed, this instrument will capture the universe in the infrared spectrum, allowing us to observe the invisible universe. Interestingly, the light first enters through these GRISM filter systems. This separates the light coming from various galaxies and stars into all these different wavelength sets. Each of these lines are galaxies and stars, and that is so amazing to me, and it actually helps understand how far away these objects are. It also provides data to analyze their properties as well, of course. So yes, really looking forward to seeing much, much more from this marvelous telescope once it is fully calibrated. 
So yes, this has been a really fun video to make. I hope that you enjoyed it as well. And yeah, we appreciate you dropping in yet again. Thanks by the way to all the many amazing supporters of what we make here. No matter if you are from Patreon, YouTube memberships or X subscribers, we appreciate you and it is an honor getting to make this content for you. Have an amazing weekend and upcoming week. And I'll leave you with a few videos here on screen that you might enjoy if you like some of our deeper dive topics. Thanks for watching all this way through and I'll see you all in the next video.